today we take a look at the albums of the decade. Happy New Year. Let's check it. I started the Pop Punk Dad around 2014 and the Pop Punk Dad TV, this YouTube channel, around 2017, 2018. By then, the decade was obviously rounding out. And at the time, honestly, I was stuck in kind of a narrow-minded way when it came to the genre of Pop Punk. Yeah, I was kind of stuck in the early 2000s because that's what I grew up with. I held that era on a pedestal, and I still kind of do to some extent, but I did then especially without giving any other new music really much of a chance. That all changed when I started the poppunkdad.com. Bands would flood my inbox from all over the world, literally, forcing me to broaden my knowledge of music, picking up some new bands that would become lifelong companions in my endless discography. With the decade finally coming to an end, you're going to see a lot of great lists that are going to come out, that are going to be about the last 10 years. So I figured it appropriate to throw my hat in the conversation with my personal best and favorite albums of the time. This is, of course, my own personal list, and it's bands and albums that I've learned to love on my own accord, as well as albums and artists that I've come across doing the pop punk dad stuff along the way. So without further ado, here's my list. I'm going to do one band, one album, one year, starting with 2010, working my way up to 2019, uh, and here we go. 2010 definitely has to go to what separates me from you by a day to remember. Arguably a band that has defined the pop punk metal and rock scene of the decade. A day to remember is what separates you from me was what I feel is their breakthrough mainstream album. Produced by Chad Gilbert of Newfound Glory and released in November of 2010, the album was absolutely all over the place at the time. Donning singles like All I Want and All Signs Point to Lauderdale, the album crossed that threshold of the scene to the mainstream. Every person I knew at the time from all walks of life started listening to the band. And I'm talking top 40 country rock people were listening to All I Want. And let's take a second to talk about the music video, which is one of the most ambitious crossovers next to the MCU franchise. Featuring everyone in the video from Trivium to Bring Me the Horizon to Fall Out Boy to MXPX to Andrew WK himself. I believe that the album had such a big success is that, the, is that every song on the album was relatable in some way. It wasn't super heavy so that the average Joe could enjoy it, which made most of the songs right for radio play, while still staying true to their hard sound with songs like Sticks and Bricks and I'll Be Tales and You Be Sonic. 2011, Neighborhoods by Blink-182. During the 2009 Grammy Awards, while announcing the best rock album of the year, Mark, Tom, and Travis of Blink-182 shocked the world by coming out of their indefinite hiatus. The band announced a tour and did just that the following summer with the Worldwide Greatest Hits Tour, which followed the announcement that the band would be back in the studio for a sixth studio album, which would be called Neighborhoods, which dropped on November 27th of 2011. Neighborhoods to me has always sounded like getting back together with an ex-girlfriend. It's like the band picked right back up where they left off without any awkwardness or animosity. All three band members I feel brought new elements to the table on this record. Tom bringing elements from Angels and Airwaves like his spacey keyboard elements. Mark Hoppus with Plus 44 and his production that he did uh, away from Blink-182 and Travis Barker with his side projects tons of side projects, his hip hop influences with the transplants, etc. While also keeping that old blank flame lit, which sounds reminiscent of their self-titled album, and even diving back to elements from Dude Ranch. The album gave a lot of hope for the band's future, and while it wasn't the last record to come out of the decade from Blink-182, it was the last record to have Tom DeLonge on it before being replaced by Matt Skiba. 2012, What You Don't See by The Story So Far. They're released in 2013, it was recorded in 2012. Spotify says it was released in 2012. And it, and it originally had a 2012 release date. So fuck it. I guess that's good enough for me. See us for Cookie. Digressing. The story so far to me has always been this brand new fresh idea to the genre of pop punk. My first introduction to the band was actually through a cover song of Empty Space by a YouTuber named Crystalline. And I'll leave a link to her below. One stripped down cover song was enough for me to be hooked. I'm a person that gets stuck on lyrics and melody. And there was a lot going on in that song. And I can only imagine what the full band version would sound like. From front to back of what you don't see, Parker Cannon's voice carries you through his range of emotions in each track. While the music itself is straightforward melodic hardcore. And takes me back to 
old school AFI or early 2000s Alkaline Trio or since his fail from the mid early 2000s who I hold on that punk rock pedestal from my adolescence. That combined with this modern new sound just did something for me. 2013 The Greatest Generation by The Wonder Years. I was a late bloomer when it came to The Wonder Years. At first listen they were more indie rock than they were pop punk to me but their dedicated following showed me that I was just late in the game with this new breed and sound that was coming forth in the decade. The Upsides was probably my first introduction to The Wonder Years, and I only listened to a handful of songs. Logan Circle and All My Friends Are In Bar Bands, immediately being the most memorable and the most relatable, but The Greatest Generation was probably the first album that I listened to straight through from front to back, and listened to countless times and I still listen to, with each song connecting to more and more with Soupy's incredibly relatable lyrics about growing up in Pennsylvania, being broke, trying to make it in a band, relationships, and friendship. Though the band had other albums come out of the decade, this one stands out the most. One of the raddest things I think about this record that I also coincidentally did on my own band's record is the last song on the record. There's like this, there's like this callback to the rest of the songs from the album they they take all of the choruses from the rest of the um other songs of the record and they trail it out on um i want to sell at my funeral and I, I thought that was such a rad idea i actually did it in my own band's uh record but it was a coincidence i put out this record in 2014 and this came out in 2013 but i didn't listen to the wonder years until like 2016 2017 which is another immediate connection and it's one of the reasons why I love this band and why I love this record. 2014 Resurrection by New Found Glory. Released on October 7th of 2014, New Found Glory's eighth studio album proved that the band could overcome most anything, being the first album to be recorded not only as a four piece after the departure of longtime guitarist Steve Klein in 2013, but the debut release on indie label Hopeless Records after concluding their contract with Epitaph of that same year. The album is by far the hardest and grittiest album that Newfound Glory has put out, with subject matters ranging from the band's departure of Klein to overcoming odds as a band in the scene over all the years. It feels like Resurrection is just that, a resurrection or comeback record for all they endured with what happened with Steve. Without getting too demonetized, I'll just leave a link in what happened in the description below if you want to check out what happened with Steve Klein all on your own. It's kind of a crazy story. I put it, I put it in another video and I think I had it up for less than a week and my whole video got taken down. So um, I'm going to just leave it in the description below. You can look up that up in, uh, on your own time. Yeah, it's that bad. But back to Resurrection. The band featured a ton of fellow punk rock comrades on this record, which really proves the camaraderie in the community, including Scott Vogel of Terror on the song Resurrection, Haley Williams of Paramore on Vicious Love, Anthony Ranieri of Bayside on Stubborn, and everyone from Mark Hoppus of Blink-22 and Mike Herrera of MXPX on Ready and Willing Part 2. 2015, Copenstetic by Knucklepuck a band that really changed my perception of what the potential of the future of punk rock and pop punk can be is the band Knuckle Puck. Their debut full-length album, Copacetic, was this fresh new idea that really left me speechless. I must have played and still play that album a dozen times a month the first time I heard it. Each track is so good, with intelligent and well-thought-out lyrics, upbeat choruses that just leave them in my head for days, and these stop breaks and fills that I've never really heard another pop punk band use up until now. This album definitely changed my predisposition of what new pop punk was. My idea was this regurgitated, watered down copycats of the new millennium bands that I grew up idolizing. Knuckle Puck's Copacetic definitely changed that for me. And all by accident, the song Disdain came on a Spotify shuffle playlist and I was blown away with it. And I had to hear more. So I found the band. And after them, I discovered bands like Real Friends, Neck Deep, and the rest is history. 2016 Holy Ghost by Modern Baseball. Another band that I'm sad that I was really late to the game with and didn't appreciate so much at the time was Modern Baseball. I remember seeing them for the first time at the 2014, that was the first annual, it was the 2014 Four Chord Music Festival and didn't really think much of them. They didn't make much of an impact on me, honestly. And it wasn't until years later, until after they broke it up, that I was like, what the hell was I missing? Anyway, Released on February 24th of 
2016. Holy Ghost is the album that did that for me from Mobo. This was also the first album that wasn't recorded by Modern Baseball themselves. Instead, they obtained help from Joe Reinhardt, from Hop Along, Joyce Manor. It wasn't DIY. And they went to Headroom Studios in Philadelphia. A lot of fans may attribute the first two albums, Sports, and You're Gonna Miss It All, to Modern Baseball's success, but Holy Ghost did it for me in some way. I don't know if it's because it's the first album from the band that I heard from front to back, and that's the reason why it holds a special place for me, or if it's sadly the last album that comes from the band before they broke up, and I'm using this record as some sort of benchmark. Something about it just does it for me. The somberness and the sadness of the record is amazing just to put on whenever you're just in one of those moods. Being that the record is split into two sections, with the first six writ written by Jake and the last five written by uh, Brendan, uh, Jake focusing mainly um, around the passing of his grandfather and Brendan focusing on his mental illness and depression. You can kind of see where the song's lines are drawn and where they fuse, but it's so brilliantly put together. And like I said, when you're in one of those moods, just put it on if you've lost something or someone or you're just in, 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 a, in a depressive state. It's just a fucking amazing album to put on. 2017, The Peace and the Panic by Neck Deep. Again, late in the game. A lot of people, and I will agree, that Life's Not Out to Get You is Neck Deep's breakthrough album. But the album that got me personally into the band is this 2017 release, uh, The Peace and the Panic. Um, yes, I listened to the band prior. Um, I started the poppunkdad.com in 2014, and uh, they came across my radar a little bit before that. Songs like December and Kelly May uh, and Gold Steps, um, I all heard, uh, especially before The Peace and the Panic, but I wasn't properly introduced to the band until I put on The Peace and the Panic and was able to just get comfortable and listen to an album from front to back. I really don't even know why the hell that was either. I think at the time it was my own stupid reasons. I was getting bombarded with like tons of emails uh, on, on the poppunkdad.com from other bands on my channel and listening to other music. So it just wasn't happening. I just couldn't enjoy other music. I had to like do work. <laughs> so when this album finally dropped, I was finally able to play catch up with everything that I uh, was just missing out on. Um, I remember also doing the same thing with um, As It Is' his, uh, OK album and also Less Than Jake's uh, Sound The Alarm uh, album the same year, um, uh, the same, around the same time as well. 2018, Belmont's self-titled album. For a band who's only put out one full-length record, they impressed the hell out of me in 2018. I still talk about this record, and I'm talking about it right now. I must have listened to their self-titled album on repeat for at least three months when it came out was even more happy to find out that I got to interview them when their, uh, when their full length finally dropped. They fall somewhere in their own category of pop punk with like crazy left field blast beats, almost these like math metal like guitar licks, breakdowns with like these really meaningful like lyrics that aren't too like corny and like cringy that make you like kind of step back and make you double think what the hell you just sang out loud. The song that I first heard from Belmont was overstepping from their between you and me EP. And I heard it by accident again on Spotify. Um, and I was hooked. Um, I'm telling you streaming services might be screwing over artists um, and, and, and paying them like shit amounts, but uh, accidentally discover discovering bands through these services is how I've found so many. But this, this record, I don't know if, if you can, uh, some people don't consider Belmont pop punk, but this record. Last but not least, 2019, Nella Vita by Grayscale. If there's one band that I can pick off this list that are going to be the future poster boys of pop punk, it has to be Grayscale. Their ability to combine pop, melody, and lyricism is absolutely unparalleled, especially in their 2019 album, Nella Vita. I've went on record in my own previous videos um, on how songs like Inviolate was my pre was one of my favorite songs of 2019. Um, Nella Vita uh, was one of my favorite albums of 2019. And here I am again talking about how it's my favorite pick album of the decade. Where their previous album, Adornment, was a straight pop punk album, uh, Nella Vita adds that extra bit of pop <laughs> that uh, even my girlfriend and daughter listen to. Uh, 
and they listen to from front to back, which is definitely saying something. Um, for them to sing along to Painkiller Weather and Inviolate, considering they only listen to radio hits, they don't listen to like my type of stuff. So that's like, it's definitely like a, a, a super plus. Grayscale was more than a, than a pop punk band though. They are a brand, a, a brand band, I guess you'd say, with a dedicated fan base that patiently awaits every single month for their new merchandise line to drop. And if that isn't enough, the band was even featured in an article of Forbes magazine on how they're changing the business model of band merchandise in the future. All right, guys, this was honestly one of the more difficult videos I've ever had to make uh, to think of all the music that has come out in the last 10 years and to only pick 10 albums out of all of that was pretty difficult. Uh, let me know down below what your favorite album, albums was of the decade. And with that, uh, happy new year guys. Let's roll the outro. Hey guys, we're at that part of the video where you should like and subscribe. And after the video is over, comment on some stuff. What did you like, what did you not like, what should I do next? Something like that. There's more to this channel than just the whole YouTube thing. I post daily blogs on thepoppunkdad.com, which features daily reviews and interviews from awesome bands from around the globe. Head on over to the Pop Punk Dad merch shop where you can find cool things like that right there. It helps the channel out and it lets me know that you love me. I have a weekly podcast called the Pop Punk Dad Cast, which is on Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Please subscribe. And hey, while you're at it, after this video, cruise on around and check out other content that tickles your fancy. Interviews with awesome bands, vlogs, cover songs, and more. You can check out all my socials, my IG, my FB, my Snapchat, and my Twitter, at the Pop Punk Dad. And above all else, guys, stay pop punk. Later.